here's the thing. Um, usually uh, at the jQuery conferences, uh, we have uh, two keynotes, and they're both largely about jQuery. Uh, so this year, we decided to, to mix it up. Uh, but the charge to do that was re almost kind of uh, threw us for a loop. You might, you might say that that charge was kind of a destructuring assignment for us. Um, and it's really, it's really important for us that that person be someone who's a generator of good talks because we, want, we just wanted to yield really good results uh, for you. Um, and <laughs> I think that the person who's going to let us do that is John K. Paul. Uh, from New York City, here to talk about ECMAScript 6 right now, right now, John K. Paul. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction, Adam. I didn't know what to expect. You never know what to expect when you're waiting for Adam Sontag to introduce you. Uh, anyway, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Thank you so much for coming this morning. It's really, really impressive, 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning, that we are all here thinking about JavaScript, jQuery, and all these, all these other great things. I'm going to be talking to you about ES6, which is, by the way, the next version of JavaScript, and how to use it right now. Uh, I was just, so ECMAScript 6 has been a long time coming, in case any of you have been following it. I was actually just told an amazing joke that I'm not going to reproduce exactly, but this slide would also work with people who are currently thinking about working on the Apple iWatch and, and, and trying to develop on that right now, because it was just announced. So my name is John Paul. I want you to be thinking about me as your fortune teller. Consider these slides as the, the tarot card that I'm going to read to show you about all of the amazing new features, new, new functionality, and the world we, you and I, as well as everyone else, will be living in potentially in a few years from now. But I challenge all of you to make it tomorrow. I'm your fortune teller. We'll start walking through this. Who am I? My name is John Paul. I work for a company called Penton Media in New York. We actually have another speaker here, Sarah Gorecki, who'll be teaching, it'll be uh, talking in about two hours. I hope you all go to her talk. I love JavaScript with a passion. Jen yesterday told us all that her favorite tag was the table tag. I thought about it. It's really cliche, I know, because I'm at a JavaScript conference, but my favorite tag is the script tag. I don't know if this is as trite to everyone else as it is, as it seems to me in my head but I hope you, yours is as well. I'd love to hear, actually, one day what everyone's favorite tag is. I just tweeted my slides, and there are some interactive parts. So if you want to uh, go to the JQCon Twitter hashtag, follow along with me. So let me start off by talking to you about ECMA International. ECMA International is the name of the standards body that standardizes ECMAScript. Um, ECMAScript is the name for the official scripting language of ECMA, which uh, ECMA is like IEEE or IETF. They're a group of people that standardize specifications. Very popularly, and I don't know if any of you remember this, this is sort of the really old flash drive. It's now called the cloud. But there was this, there was this thing called floppy disks. And, and, and it, re, it was replaced by the cloud pretty quickly. There was this zip disk thing in the middle. But they are actually standardized officially by ECMA International. ECMA International also standardizes uh, the Dart programming language, the C-sharp programming language, lots of other things. But the, the, the best of all of the world, the JavaScript, is standardized by them. And then floppy disk, which I would love to use one day just for the nostalgia. So as any standard body in the world has to be, standard bodies are slow. Realistically, the amount of time that it's taken for any particular specification to get from idea stage through drafting and then all the way through ratification, it's way longer than any snail could possibly intend to live. No snail could possibly live the amount of years that it takes for any specification to be complete. ECMAScript by itself, we've had a few versions so far. The first one, or a while ago, ECMAScript 3 came out in 1999. That introduced some really crazy features. I don't know if you're ready for this. ECMAScript 3 added regular expressions and try-catch. Whoa. Like, I can't even imagine a language right now that doesn't have try-catch. But it was very exciting all the way back then. Then there was a long, long period in between ECMAScript 3 and ECMAScript 5, 10 years. ECMAScript 5 included a lot of the common features that uh, programming library or, or JavaScript libraries added, like function.prototype.bind, array.prototype.map, a lot of the things that we are used to right now as JavaScript developers was added in ECMAScript 5. 
between ECMAScript 3 and ECMAScript 5, there was way more ideas generated that could actually be included in any one specification and any one new version of JavaScript. They, we couldn't fit everything that people could possibly come up with as great ideas into the ECMAScript version 5. Between 3 and 5, those 10 years was a Cambrian explosion of all cool things taken from many other languages and many other different uh, tools. ECMAScript 6 right now is on the track to being finished, is on track to being finished within this year. There's currently no more debate about the, the features that are going to be in or the features that are going to be out. It's just the process of actually sitting down and having people who know a lot more about context-free grammars and computer science than, than I do actually write down drafts of specifications that are uh, extremely boring, but gratefully someone actually does it to make sure that we, we don't have bugs in our, in our actual implementation. So all of these things, they are slower than snails. 10 years, then five years, maybe. But really, none of these things have to matter to us. Who cares at all about when these things are ratified? We now have the ability to actually use a lot of these features without waiting for a standards body to say that, that they're all complete, or even browser vendors to actually say all of these features are implemented. So something that I love, and the big reason of why I'm even in the software industry, is that ideas that other programming languages, other tools, other frameworks have, we can take with very little overhead and build into our own tools and our own systems. That's really what ECMAScript 6 is all about. It has paved the cow paths. That was the goal for the entire specification in the first place. It's taken great things that libraries have given us, that other programming languages have given us, and has built a whole litany of features. There's over 100 new features in uh, ECMAScript 6 that is all taken from the great things that, that jQuery has been doing, that underscore Lodash has been doing, that all, uh, all many other different pieces of the JavaScript community at large have already built into their, the, into their uh, tool sets and into their workflow. ECMAScript 6 is just standardizing that thing that we already do, that we know we need, that currently takes 10 lines of code that might soon take one line of code. And what's great about all of the work that's been done to make this new specification and all of these new features is ECMAScript 6 is completely backwards compatible with every old version of JavaScript. So when all of these features are actually implemented in browsers, you can still use all of the code that you have already written. You can take jQuery from 1998. jQuery didn't exist in 1998, but it took a while after that. But whatever, whatever JavaScript you were writing then, the walk the DOM scripts that you copied and pasted from from um, some really old forum, I forget the name of that thing. But there, there are lots of really old JavaScript pieces that I still use now that will still work forever. This isn't like, for example, Python, where Python between version two and three, they completely broke backwards compatibility and you have to think about every time you want to create a new project or run a new, or add a new library, does this particular library work in Python two or Python three? JavaScript isn't like that. All of these new features that were through lots of difficulty and lots of very complicated work, we're built to be backwards compatible completely, and we get to steal from all of these ideas from all of these other languages, from CoffeeScript, Python, Ruby, Lisp. We have taken all of these great ideas and are able to incorporate them into our, our tried and true JavaScript right now. So I'm going to go through and start talking to you about some of these features that actually make our lives a lot easier if, uh, if you do have those slides up on your screen, you can actually go through and type into this and click on that big ugly run button uh, anytime if you'd like. So one of the really common cow paths that we have to tread as JavaScript developers is index of greater than negative one. I don't know about you, I type this dozens of times a day. Index of is the most annoying and often used way to check if a string is, if one substring is inside of another. So here, if you see, I have this variable has v, I check to see if it's there, and alas, it is there. What JavaScript ECMAScript 6 has added is, wait for it, whoa, whoa, does that, that just, it just worked, it says it's there, wait, let me check another letter, no, it's not there, it's false, this is amazing. This small little word contains that every other programming language has. We have that now. We have the ability 
to not need to worry about this thing index of that no one, I don't really know where it came or why it happened to be that way that the convention or idiom turned out that way. But we can use this nice thing called contains. This is something that we all use every day. It's a lot easier when, to read when you see it this way. So next, the promise specification. So I don't know about you, but I have, uh, there are promises now everywhere. Every blog post, every JS Weekly, promises are the most popular thing since Dominic Danicola and the promises A plus specification really broke through um, all of our heads that it's the best way to go with respect to asynchronous programming. Promises are now built into the JavaScript language with, with ECMAScript 6. We don't have to worry about adding uh, jQuery for jQuery deferreds or when or Q or async or all of the other dozen or so, Bluebird, all of the other dozens of promise libraries that all do very similar things. What ECMAScript 6 did was say, all of you developers, you're all doing this anyway. You're all doing this slightly different ways, but in the end, if we're all conforming to one specification, we can build this into the language for you. So here, I uh, create a new promise using the new promise API in ECMAScript 6. Uh, I set it to resolve after one second, and then here, uh, after that, I alert. And here, what I, the, the first and foremost thing I want to teach you is that one second is actually a really long time when you're standing up here on a talk. I thought it was really fast. It's only one second. It's nothing. No. It's a long time. So now that we have promises in the language, we don't have to rely on libraries. Libraries can add extra functionality to make working with these much simpler. But this is another thing that we all use anyway, and now it makes a lot more sense and is in the language. First, we have contains, string.contains. Then we have promises. Then we have <coughs> object.assign. So object.assign is something that um, has been built right now. So jQuery has jQuery extend, which merges two objects. Underscore has underscore extend. Low dash has low dash extend. I think Ember has one. Angular has one. Pretty much every big group of JavaScript code that you could get includes on its own uh, a piece of uh, code to merge two objects together. This is now built into ECMAScript 6, and other cow path that we all have treaded. You can use object.assign, pass multiple objects to it, and it merges them all together. So gone through merging, merging objects, which is something that every single library provides for you. Contains is something we all do every day, and I don't know how we haven't gotten really annoyed that it doesn't actually make sense. Promises that we use across the board. Now we have something which every other programming language the Javas, the Pythons, the Rubies, they all have, I'm, I'm saying every other programming language, but I'm listing all the web programming languages. Please just assume that I mean all the other ones too that we don't actually use very regularly. C Sharp too. It has sets now, which are bags of unordered um, values that happen to be uh, unique within the system. So here I create a new set. I add A, B, C, and then I try to add B again. When I run this, there are actually only three items inside the, um, I, there are only three items inside of the set, and it's A, B, and C. The second B is not added because the set itself keeps uh, uniqueness as an invariant. Another piece added to ECMAScript 6 that, we, that every other programming language has. Every other pr uh, programming language also has the idea of a map, the map between any arbitrary object and a value. This is something that's very similar. If you say, usually what we do is use objects for keys and values. We use objects to make it seem like there is, or we use objects to map keys to values. We can do the exact same thing with a map, which has a much nicer syntax for setting something. And when you run this, you see that both, there is a way to check if both the object and the map has a value inside. It's either using key in obj, which is the syntax for objects, or map.has key, which again, ECMAScript 6 is trying to make um, APIs that actually read more like English, which is really useful. Map.has key is a lot easier to read, in my opinion. The, but what is different here between objects and maps 
is that objects behind the scenes actually have properties that are not included right here that you can't actually see. That's a really annoying if you ever happen to want to, for example, iterate over them or find all of the keys and do something with each of those keys. There is hidden, there are hidden inside of this syntax, there are other properties, like for example, this Dunder Proto thing. Dunder Proto is another piece of ECMAScript 6 that I'm not gonna go into in detail here, but even though it looks like there's only one key inside of this object, when I run this, you'll see there is actually Dunder Proto. There are two keys, if not more, whereas the map does not have something like that. So map is a much better and more comprehensive way of having keys and values next to each other instead of objects, which do a whole lot more than that without within JavaScript. We have sets and maps, both of which are in every other programming language that are not objects or whatever else you could use for a set. We have all of these pieces that are already standardized and already ready to use and implement in a browser. So how do we actually do that? How can we use that? You're all sitting here at the jQuery conference, so I have confidence that everyone here can do at least one thing. And that one thing is adding jQuery to a page. Okay? <laughs> And I may, I'm going to make that assumption, and you, I, I hear at least a little bit of laughter that makes it seem it's either true or oddly not true. <laughs> I don't know which one. So you can add jQuery, and, and in order to do that, you get to use my favorite tag, the script tag. With one humble script tag, which is all you need to do, and you can do in five minutes, all of the features that I just described, plus more, maps, sets, promises, string contains, object assign, and so much more, you can do that by adding one single script tag and using the ES6 shim by Paul Miller. It adds all of these things, plus so much more, in five minutes. Not even, you can just copy paste the script tag. I know it's hard, you gotta remember the type, text slash JavaScript, it's complicated, I know. Copy and paste the script tag, include this library, put your source inside, and you're done. You have all of these features that have already been standardized, already built into some browsers, but you have these to, for all of the browsers that support ECMAScript 5 and up. So for most of these features, you can do this in IE8+, plus. you put in another shim, which is another 30 seconds of copy-paste, and you have basically down to IE6 for a lot of these features. So we have a bunch of these things that we can do in five minutes. So this is as close to right now as we can get and I'm going to continue down the road of showing you more features, showing you more, fe more of our future as I look deeper and farther into this crystal ball, into the world we are all going to live in very, very soon. The next feature I have here is block scoped variables. So JavaScript, I don't know how much you've known about how scoping works in JavaScript, but JavaScript has the global scope or function scope as of, as of right now in ECMAScript 5. What I do here is uh, create an array, one, two, and three, create an object, sorry, create an array that had um, nothing in it. And then I iterate through that array using a for loop. I add a new, I add a new uh, function to the output that alerts the value uh, at that index of the array. So this is a really common interview question, so I'm helping you out here. I haven't actually given it myself, but I have been asked it multiple times in multiple situations. The question here is what will be alerted and, and someone will write this on a piece of paper and expect you to read it and actually try it. Gratefully here, if you have the slides open or if you're gonna see me in a second, you just get to run them. But what, when I look at this code, I have an expectation. I have an expectation that I will see the numbers one, two, and three alerted. But actually, I get three, three, and three. So this is because JavaScript doesn't have, the, the variable declaration doesn't have a way of being scoped to each of these iterations of the for loop. There is actually only one place in memory for the variable val. There is only one val. There are not three different places in memory. So once we actually alert all of these things, since there's only, there can only be one value of val at any one given time, it alerts three, three different times. What ECMAScript 6 does is add a new way of declaring a variable. It adds a new keyword, or uses a new keyword, called let. What let does is create a variable that is scoped to that particular block. When I say block, I mean between these two curlies right here. Now when I, when I run this, I get one, two, and three. 
Using the let keyword, I can create variables that are scoped to the particular block that they're in. This is something that, every, that, that C has, that C++ has. This is the way most languages work that, are, that have very similar C syntax. This is, just happens to not be how JavaScript works. JavaScript by itself, the variables are either in the global scope or the function scope until the introduction of this keyword let that will add block scoping to the language. If you want a lot more details about how all of this scoping works, right after this talk, the next talk, Corey Frang is giving a talk going through the details of how scoping works, and I think he's including let as well. There, the, he'll give an explanation of, of, of how this works in a little bit more detail, but now we, we have ECMAScript 6, and using the tools I'll be able to show you soon, we were able to avoid this problem and see this code that actually does what it looks like it does. You do not have to go through and think about all of the nitty gritties of how JavaScript works in order to see this does exactly what you want it to do. So we've gone through the, um, we've gone through the let keyword. Now I'll show you array comprehensions. So array comprehensions is just another one of those features that are, it's a really nice syntactic sugar over uh, something we do fairly often. This is stolen basically from Python. Python has list comprehensions that do something very similar. The, the order is backwards. It actually maps the, matches the order of the way C sharp does list comprehensions. I think you can see what this is doing obviously. Using this new syntax with the square bracket around four x of array and then showing what you want to do on the right side, how you want to transform the values in that array. I can show you now, I get two, four, six, and eight because I'm doubling each of these values using this, list, uh, using this array comprehension. This is another piece of syntax in addition to the let keyword that ES6 adds to make our lives easier. It's things that we do every day using function.prototype.map we can use, sorry, array.prototype.map, we can use this kind of syntax to achieve. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about one of the many controversial topics that I'll be talking about during the next, I don't know, 25 or so minutes. I'm gonna to talk to you about the fat arrow, which is another way now to use, to create a function in JavaScript. There are six or seven ways right now, there's now going to be seven or eight with the addition of ECMAScript 6. And, I, and, and the predominant, it, so there are some people out there that really, really don't like typing the characters F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N. If you are one of these people, you're going to love this because this is like so short, you don't even need this. So right here is the creation of a function. That function is taking the value, the parameter X and doubling it. So if you see here, I can run. This, you can actually expand this to multiple lines if you want. So this right now is returning. When there is one statement inside of a fat arrow expression, it automatically returns it. I can add curlies and add the word return. And again, it does the same thing. About the sixth time live coding worked fine. That's great. Now, I'll show you a little bit more about what fat arrow does. So fat arrow, in addition to just being a shorter way of creating functions, which is, which is nice if you really don't like typing it, it has one very salient semantic difference. And what that difference is, is assigning that this value for, this, for, the, um, for what is inside of that JavaScript, this binding to whatever this is in the outer scope. So bear with me. If I, so right now I'm creating an object Inside of that object, I am running, an, uh, I have a function that initializes it, and inside of that, it uses the keyword this. When I click on run here, I get we're in Chicago, because the location of this inside of this object is Chicago, and this inside of this function, because I'm using this fat arrow, is set to object itself. If I change this to So those are almost roughly equivalent, except for the use of this inside. Because I'm using this inside, now when I run this, I don't get anything. And I don't get anything because, I actually get an, oh, of course, right after I said it was gonna work. Hmm. 
Hmm. So, have any of you used the use stricter directive? Okay, so I encourage you all to add use strict to the top of every one of your files as you're developing. What this new function allows you to do, when I switch this to function, there's actually an error here. Because I am, use, because I am using strict, what, because this is using the regular function, the this that I'm pointing to is actually undefined because once you're in strict mode in JavaScript, it prevents you from accidentally utilizing a lot of the foot guns in the programming language and makes sure that whenever you're trying to look up something and it's not explicitly set as if when you use the new syntax here. When you use the new syntax, this is explicitly set to the value outside, to the object itself, and then you don't have to worry about it. So, new feature, fat arrow, new feature, um, let, and new feature array comprehension. The next one I'm going to go through is destructuring assignment. Destructuring assignment is, the, this is probably the most, from the most esoteric programming languages out there. This is actually stolen from Lisp, which some of us really want to use, some of us don't ever get the opportunity to use, but it has a lot of very interesting features, and this is one of them that now JavaScript gets to have. Destructuring assignment is a way to uh, use inside of variable declarations or parameter lists this special syntax that allows us to break down what happens to be in the parameters. So I don't know about you, but the first one, two, six lines of pretty much every function I write are is taking some values out of the uh, the option. Sorry, out of the arguments array, or the arguments object. Or, um, or checking to see if the first value, if the second value is undefined, and if so, moving the value from the third. All of this code now goes away because we can, using the structuring assignment, actually break down in the syntax of the parameter list the values you want to get. So here, I pass, I create an array with values one, two, and three. I pass to the function that array. And now, instead of taking the time to, for example, what I would have to do before is var first equals arguments zero, or then do something with that, I can do all of that work directly inside of the parameter list by using an array, saying that array's first item is bound to this name, this variable, the second item is here, and here when I run this, I get one and three. This is really useful to not have to do all of the typing and mental understanding about where pieces fit into your arguments. Additionally, destructuring assignment, in addition to destructuring assignment, we also have what's called the, the rest parameter. So para right now, if you want to get the arguments to a, to a function, you have to use the special thing called arguments. Oops. Arguments. The arguments object is sort of like an array. It has, it's an object that has number indexes, but it's not an array itself. You ha if you want to cut values to it, there's a very common pattern to, um, to slice it and, and be, able to use it as a, be able to use it as an array after doing that. Using ECMAScript 6, when you use this special dot, dot, dot syntax, you get an array that you can do anything you want with. For example, you can actually destructure that additionally, like here on line three. I have arguments, I then destructure that using, this is the same thing as the destructuring I showed you earlier, except not in a parameter list, but inside of a variable declaration. And then I can do whatever I want with those, those variables that were declared here. Another piece of syntactic sugar comes from Lisp and has lots of really good uses as you actually start using this in your JavaScript code. Okay. So this one is something that's really frustrating, and I don't know how we have—I don't know how we've lasted so long with the concatenating operator. We finally have template strings in JavaScript, something that the Rubies of the world, I think, have been laughing at us for a very long time. We can create without worrying about lots of plus signs and slash ends strings using the backticks. So here, if I uh, I set up two variables using the special new backtick syntax and dollar curly, I can include inside of my string variables that are automatically concatenated together. You don't have to sit through the plus space enter key plus new string plus value that I have done thousands of times while, while working in JavaScript. 
Here we just get to type backtick and, and have one long string with everything there. Additionally, there is support finally for multi-line strings. So here, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's amazing. There's, thank you, yeah, I did, I did all the work. It wasn't that special Sanders body at all. Like I'm the one who told them to do this and they said, okay. So no more slash ends or trying to remember what the correct slash r slash n thing is. It's all, it's all built in now to the system. Another piece of syntax. We have template strings, lets, array comprehensions, fat arrows, so many, different, so many different pieces. We also have generators. So generators are a, a new type of function that return back an iterator that allows a function to start, pause and start execution again inside of one call. So here I have this thing that looks like a function, except it has this special star thing, which, which happens to be uh, one of the very few valid syntaxes that can actually be backwards compatible within, the, within uh, the, the scope of all of what JavaScript can be. Here I have this, this while true loop, which would normally mean you know, your code never stops running because it's while true and it just continues to do something. But inside it, it adds this special new keyword called yield. Using this syntax, creating a generator, and using this other feature, this other new feature called for of, here I can go through each of, I can step through this function, it'll execute, every, every time it executes, it, it increments the value that it, um, that it will yield. And here I will get back one, two, and three. Then four, because that's less than three. So greater than three. So this is a fairly reductive, uh, trivial case. What generators are hopefully going to be used for are a much nicer way to write asynchronous code using promises, using any other library like nodes async. There are already some, for example, task.js or co. There are already libraries that use generators to give us very nice syntaxes around, um, around dealing with asynchronous operations. And lastly, for right now, we have class syntax, the second of many controversial things in JavaScript. So now people who come from other programming languages see this thing that looks like a class that has something called a constructor. It works very similarly, and it is all syntactic sugar over what we have right now. This, um, this all eventually boils down to prototypal inheritance, but we have a syntax for it that allows us to extend without having to know the names. We're given this uh, way to call super, just like how, for example, Java has, um, with, with a few changes here. What happened there? So using this class syntax, we can model very similarly to what we would in more classically object-oriented languages. Using this new syntax, we can also do some one thing that we could never do before, which is actually correctly extend an array. Currently in JavaScript, ECMAScript version five, there's no way to correctly and without really weird gotchas around the length property of an array to extend an array to do anything differently. Using this new class syntax, assuming we don't get into any of the arguments about it being proper or not proper for the language to have this, it's going to do great things. Okay, I know what you're thinking. I've just been listing out these things. I'm probably just as, as um, this guy is, very concerned as to where we're actually going. Eventually, there is so much more. I'm scratching the surface as to all of the new hundred and something odd new features in JavaScript. And eventually, soon, I want to show you what it is to actually implement all of these things in your code bases tomorrow. But first, I want to talk about the most controversial topic of all, modules. Where did that go? So we have now module systems in JavaScript. We have, most predominantly, not considering ECMAScript 6, we have two big module systems. One, CommonJS, which is predominantly used in Node. Also, can also be used in the browser using Browserify, which is a tool to use the CommonJS module system in the browser. We also have um, AMD. AMD is, the, is most pro popularly used with an implementation called RequireJS. It is uh, usually used in the browser mode of, um, of creating JavaScript modules. 
It's been 10 years. It was, it was 10 years from the original, from ECMAScript 3 to ECMAScript 5. It's been five more after that. So it's been a very long time since a lot of people have been using JavaScript on a regular basis for there not to be a module system. So what happened? Two different groups created their own, and it, they were all pretty successful on their own. ECMAScript 6 now, actually, this, this whole, there was a really great blog post that came out in the JS Weekly yesterday that, that describes all of the new module system in detail. Uh, I'll go through it really quickly here. The new module system um, allows you to create files and, and export and use this new syntax called export default to create values that can then be imported into other files. So if I have a file named a.js, I can include that into another file, b.js, by importing the name. There are ways to name exports in this new, in this new syntax, like uh, specif instead of exporting default, actually exporting the names of the variables, and then using this new syntax, import them into my other files. Then there is this, there's a way to name exports and import them as a namespace. And this is the most po this is the way that most, for example, node modules work using the modules exports object. We can, cr we can export individual names and then using import star as name of module, we can include them just like how right now node exports FS, for example, that has uh, a, dozen different, uh, a dozen different functions or properties on it. Using ECMAScript 6 modules, we can actually achieve all of the use cases that both, require, both AMD and CommonJS prov uh, currently provide for using uh, a system loader, which is a, separate spec uh, is a separate group of work that I'm not gonna go into here, but the new module system, although very controversial and some people swear that they will never use it, once we all get on this bandwagon, we will actually have the ability to support all of the use cases that both sides argue about fairly regularly. Okay. So I'm so excited. Like, you don't understand how excited I am. I got so excited. I mean, Ron Swanson's excited, so we have to be. This is like, this is so cool. There are so many things. One, I scratch the surface. Two, what I've already talked about changes the way we develop code. But so not only is this the time for my obligatory cat animated GIF, but we can't actually do this very easily. The way to do this, so the, the proper way to do this is actually you can go through Chrome, flags, and then you can search for experimental JavaScript, and you could enable this, and it would, it would work, and, and you could do the equivalent ones in, in Firefox about config, and, and you could actually tell all of your users to do the same thing. This is, uh, this is sort of unreasonable, and which is why this, is, this, this sad cat is so impactful, but the and, and so I'm pretty jealous of, of Node here because Node gets to just add this flag dash dash harmony where suddenly they, they have a lot of these features. Some of them are not necessarily implemented as the standard is, but they, they get a lot of this really easily. We, have sh we can add those shims in five seconds to get one big group of these features, but we can't do that here to, to add all of the new syntaxes that, that we, can, we want to be able to use. So how do we actually do that? We can use this tool called Tracer. So Tracer is a transpiler from ECMAScript 6 to ECMAScript 5. So you can, in a similar way that CoffeeScript, you write CoffeeScript, or I'm not gonna label anyone here, you might write CoffeeScript, and you might transpile that to JavaScript. You can write ECMAScript 6 and, um, and Tracer itself will spit out ECMAScript 5 that you can then use in your browser. You can then use in a script tag and use as if it were, you know, the, as if it's something you can do right now. You can actually, if you're following along, try this in the REPL. JavaScript, you can type in this piece of JavaScript on the top, and what it does is do all of the really annoying concatenation that, that none of us actually want to do ever again. There are tools across the board for doing this. You can copy and paste each of these. There's a grunt tracer, if you happen to be using grunt by Aaron Frost, you can copy this piece of config into, the, into your grunt file and it should work just fine. There's a gulp version for, um, for gulp tracer. There's a broccoli version, also by Sin, both of these by Sindra, that, um, that allows you to use broccoli to convert ECMAScript 6 into ECMAScript 5. I am currently working on Oink, Sneeze, or Brussels sprouts? I haven't decided 
what the name will be. My favorite vegetable is Brussels sprouts, and I'm in a favorite mood because of the script tag thing. So I might go with that, but I think that Scott Gonzalez would not be a fan of me adding to the, to the list of tools. So, um, so once eventually there will be a Brussels sprouts tracer. There is also an ES6ify that, that Thorsten Lorenz has written. It's a browserify transform, if you happen to be using it, that will take an ES6, spit out ES5 that you can actually use in browsers today, right now. So just to let you know, there's a little bit of, there's this special thing called source maps. Source maps allow you to, when you debug, if you want to actually go through this process of adding these transpilers to your code base, you can, um, you can actually see using source maps in your browser console, you can look at the code as if it were ECMAScript 6, even though behind the scenes, it's compiled all of this into the equivalent ECMAScript 5 that is really ugly that none of us want to actually write anymore. Using source maps, you can debug this way, and it's something that's really useful as you get into building these things, um, building these systems on your own. What happened here? So, I don't know about you, but I have no chance on Earth to solve this Rubik's Cube. <laughs> at all. There are some pieces of ECMAScript 6 out of the hundred odd different pieces of this specification that cannot be solved using any of these methods. Some of these pieces that we have to find, uh, we have to wait for the actual implementations to come by, and some of these are really cool. There are, there, they, these are the intractable pieces of ECMAScript 6 that we can't currently build into any browser right now. There are some more than this, but most popularly weak maps and proxies. These are pieces that chances are us in user land won't use nearly as much as the library builders, the jQueries, the Angulars, the Embers of the world. But then there's also, and most importantly, and really coolly, is tail call optimization. So JavaScript is finally getting the ability to write a lot of recursive code without worrying about, um, calling, about function calling itself too much and blowing through the stack. I have an admission to make, and it's really awkward for me to say, and I, it is that I don't actually write recursive code that much. But it's because I feel like I don't really know how it is to be a functional programmer. And this afternoon, there are two talks, one by Trevor and one by Bodel, that will both be really interesting and you should go to about functional programming. You'll get a reason to actually really care about tail call optimization, because I'm sure that recursion occurs somewhere in the world of a functional programmer. So I have just shown you the tip of the iceberg here. I have shown you, let's say, 20 or so out of the 100. There are so many more pieces to this then that will get you even more excited that Ron Swanson and all of us here combined want to actually see. There is a list, so if you click on this link over here, there is a list that Kangax has put together of all of the different features and all of where they are aren't supported. The list goes on for a while. All of these things are things you should go and take a look at, see what other new features are even supported by Tracer or ES6 Shim that I didn't talk about. There's a lot out there that will make our lives easier, that will keep our you know, carpal tunnel a little bit at bay and make us type a little bit less um, regularly. So there, I, what, I, what I think that you should do when you go home, not even, I think you should do this between the break, between this talk and the next talk, I think you should add ES6 shim, because it takes 30 seconds. It's just copying and pasting, and I know you can all use jQuery. I've had that confirmation, because I got the, you know, the sweeping laugh thing. I know you all can do it. Play around in the Tracer REPL. So click on the link in these slides. Go and see what it is that, when you type in some ECMAScript 6 or copy and paste from my slides, see what it actually turns into, because it's actually completely understandable in most cases. You can see, you can see the win of not having to type all of that by just typing the one line that you type um, into the Tracer REPL. Read up on ECMAScript 6 features. There are lots of blog posts out there. Read Aria Hidayat, who's actually speaking later today. I don't think about ECMAScript 6, but his blog has a lot of information. I think he's sitting over there somewhere. Buzz blog has a lot of information about what it is, what new, what new features are, how to use them, and how they can really help you in your development life. It also shows how amazing jQuery Conf is to get all of these amazing speakers that, that I'm actually referring to in these, in these slides. So read up uh, Axel Ruschmeyer's blog has a lot of great information on ECMAScript 6, and a lot of the stuff I have here came from, uh, came from examples um, and information he's given. 
read up on Adi Osmani, who has given a lot, who's written a lot about actual workflows. So he has written to, he has written a blog post about how to use, for example, Grunt Tracer in and build that into your process at work. And this is the the most, this is the well, most the thing I want you to take away with most. Go back to work, because I'm pretty sure that you all work in JavaScript and you all have some version control system that allows you to create a branch or tag, or I don't know if you're using CVS and, or something like that, but create a branch with some ES6 transpiler. Show, that, show the rest of your team, look, this, takes, this took me a day to do, at most, maybe it's probably like an hour, took me a day to do, and I can do all of these great things. We can all do that if we all get on this bandwagon of transpiling our code, like we probably already do, especially if you already use CoffeeScript or something like that. And, um, and show that this is something that we can actually do right now, today, to make our coding lives easier. I want you to all feel as to the, that the, the best thing we can do is transpile and shim all of the ES6. This is so exciting that we can do all of this now. The features are in place. There aren't any more discussions or arguments about what actually is going to be in or out. The, all of these systems are now being built, and some of the, to be honest, Chrome is actually, or V8 is already building in features from ECMAScript 7. Object observed, which isn't even in the ECMAScript 6 specification. So, so we, are, we are getting to a place where we are running even further ahead than we can imagine. We just actually have to start using these things now. And, and now for, for my, my second cat obligatory, obligate, um, obligatory animated GIF, I want you to feel like Superman cat. We got, jump over the bookshelf with adding a shim. We jump over to the curtains by adding this translation. I want you to get really excited that this is what you can do right now when you go home. I have no doubt. Add these translation features, write the blog post, tell people what we're doing, because right now it is this easy. You can see the cat doing it. It's no problem. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, so before we put up the wall, uh, we're going to give away the last, oh, questions. Anyone have questions about JavaScript? Sorry, I, it's probably because I wrote that on the slide. I don't know if that's Oh, thank right. you, questions. Anyone have questions about JavaScript? JavaScript. There we go. Uh, just because I'm too lazy to look it up, uh, are all of your examples uh, found in the shim? No, so only the first set of examples. So there are, before I introduced the shim, all of those are. That many of the, the features that I described after that are required to be transpiled. So basically, everything that's in addition to the standard library, like maps, sets, promises, string contains, those can all be shimmed with, with 30 seconds of adding a script tag. The features that are actually new syntaxes, like destructuring assignment or, or, um, or let or array comprehensions. You can't, there's, there's no way to add a script tag that would just add those things. So you have to use the transpiler for that. OK, we're done. Everyone knows everything about oh, JavaScript. There's a, there a question. Uh, nope. Oh, Um, uh, regarding, uh, regarding the modules, I, I, I could probably look this up, but you might already know this. Uh, when you, whenever you import something, you have to now refer to uh, a JavaScript file, right, from which to import. But uh, browsers have, have a very complex uh, code uh, as to whether they allow or do not allow the inclusion of JavaScript from either other JavaScript or from the page itself. So. So this means that the browser is not now going to have to move that code there because you could include JavaScript from some other URL, and that so the decision as to whether that's allowed or not needs to be made. So this is kind of architecturally, it seems like it might be intrusive for the browser. You know, do you know how how that's going to be done? So I didn't actually describe this, but the the, the module system that I described here is the module syntax for ECMAScript six. The way that this is actually loaded is as separate specifications. So you can, there's actually an example in something called system.js. So JavaScript will have a system loader that will 
define for each environment. There will be a different one and a different, they will both be configurable, for example, for Node and for the browser. And the system loader for the browser will allow you to specify when you, when you decide to import something from some string. Should it, look up over the, should it look up over the internet for this? Should it try to find something on the file system? How, however, that, however that works out. There is a, there is a shim for that at, at something called shim.js, and we can talk about that later in a little more detail. What is the uh, ES6 stance on inheritance, like pass.prototype? What was the last thing you said? Pass.prototype? Like, other, yeah, like other than dot .prototype, like, are, are there any changes to inheritance? Sure, so there is the addition of class syntax, which is actually, so class syntax is, so JavaScript is still a prototypal-based inheritance system. Class syntax is just syntactic sugar over some equivalent. You can try this out in the Tracer REPL, actually, and see when you type class something curlies, it, all, it converts over to all of the equivalent prototype calls for you. So JavaScript at its core is not changing, but they, there is an addition of the class syntax to allow for writing that e in, a, in an easier way. It also adds super, which is something you could do right now. It adds this sugar around super. With the vast amount of modules that are in the node system, uh, and surely uh, many projects built with required JS using AM AMD, how does one take those modules and make them work with this ESX class uh, uh, module system? Sure. So there are so using there are a few different libraries out there to do that. There is there is a library called JSPM, which is one of the you know hopefully being able to it's a library that intends to be able to consume ES6 modules, AMD modules, Common JS modules, and be able to pull from. Bower, NPM, GitHub, and so on. It's supposed, it's supposed to solve everything in the whole world. So it's something that you, should, you can try to do something like that. You can, th there are t also tools that will automatically convert um, AMD and CommonJS into, um, into the equivalent ECMAScript 6 module syntax. So right now, in order to use all of these things, you have to use a tool like uh, JSPM and the system.js loader. But once these things are built into browsers, there will be more standard mechanisms of doing uh, those kinds of things. We good? Cool. Uh, let's thank John, uh, Paul, one more time. Thank you.